uh, we have the session titled Emerging Technologies and Their Socio-Political Impact. And this is delivered by um, Professor Anand Padmanabhan, who's the Dean of our law school. Uh, so for a formal introduction about uh, Professor Padmanabhan, I'd like to say that he is a visiting fellow at the Center for Policy Research. And uh, over the past few years, he has critically examined the policy implications of a wide range of technologies and solutions, including digital identities, blockchain, civilian drones, gene editing, and electric mobility, and with special focus on the ease of innovating in India. This chapter on big data in new volume on regulation in India, design capacity performance is part of a continuing initiative to examine public law and regulatory dimensions of new technologies. It builds on his understanding of the Indian state and the Supreme Court within the constitutional context, explored through chapters in rethinking public institutions in India, and also the Oxford Handbook of the Indian Constitution. Uh, Professor Padmanabhan engages in broader public conversations on the impact of technology through his opinion pieces in the print Live Mint, Indian Express, and other print and news media. Uh, previously, Professor Padmanabhan worked with the uh, Carnegie uh, Endowment for International Peace, New Delhi, uh, starting their technology policy research initiatives in India, and Global Technology Summit in Bengaluru, uh, an annual forum for stakeholder, stakeholder conversations on technology policy. Uh, he has practiced law in the Madras High Court and has taught at several institutions, including the National Law University, Jodhpur, and the National Law School of Indian University, uh, Bangalore. Uh, Dr. Padmanabhan holds doctoral and master's degrees in law and from uh, in law from the University of Pennsylvania, uh, Carey Law School. Um, well, actually, uh, Professor Padmanabhan has been instrumental in setting up the Daksha Foundation, you know, last year as part of the law school. And uh, from whatever I know, he's an expert on uh, tech law. So I'm sure this talk will be very interesting. And uh, so now I hand it over to uh, him. Uh, over to you, Anand. Thanks, thanks Nandini. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm really happy to finally meet our uh, inaugural liberal arts uh, and data sciences cohorts. Uh, this is really a great uh, you know, occasion for the university. And uh, in, in some ways, uh, personally, for me to see all of you here, I mean, I was uh, literally employee number two at Sai University came in uh, in August 2019 and have been a part of the journey uh, from then uh, really seen it uh, you know induct its first uh, batch of uh, students last year uh, in the form of the Daksha fellowship which I uh, continue to direct and uh, now to see all of you here our first uh, degree programs uh, it, it really is a joy uh, I mean, this is also a moment of, uh, to, to an extent, a moment of reflection because uh, uh, when, I, when I see the kind of uh, amazing uh, orientation activities that the admissions and student life teams have put together for you, I kind of uh, am compelled at some level to go back to my orientation at NLS Bangalore, where for some reason the university felt uh, the best way to get us oriented is to just ask us, what is law? And then we went on this uh, two-hour incursion into philosophy, which is damn boring. And by the end of it all, I really was doubting whether I made the right choice to switch from engineering to law. Hopefully, I don't intend to make you guys go through that. And I, I hope uh, you know that everything that we are uh, doing as a university would, in fact, uh, make you feel more excited about learning than uh, feel a sense of, oh, my God, this is going to be a heavily technical next, you know, a few years of, of my life. Uh, and uh, having looked at, you know, the way education has evolved, and this is something that uh, the vice chancellor and I have had extensive uh, conversations on, uh, somewhere we, we, we have felt as a university that there's a huge vacuum of thinking in a multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary manner about liberal arts. And uh, uh, so in, 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 in many ways, what I'll be trying to uh, do in the next uh, 40 minutes or so of my uh, lecture, and then you know, we can have questions. But feel free, of course, to post your questions in the chat window. Uh, raise your hand. I mean, this is really an interaction, particularly as I, as I know that you know, we are all 
uh, here after lunch uh, so i don't intend at all to put you guys to sleep uh, i mean so i'm really kind of uh, uh, going to encapsulate some of these broader conversations that we have had institutionally and bring in the technology context uh, within the, the the larger context of these uh, conversations and why so because in many ways whatever discipline we uh, kind of get ourselves trained in today it uh, law humanities i mean economics social sciences uh, pure sciences the technological transformations around us are difficult to ignore uh, even if we want to kind of uh, be absolutely uh, luddite in our approach to life i don't think life is going to allow us to be so uh, from from the very fact that we are all inter- interacting on account of the pandemic using the zoom platform uh, to the fact that you know every piece of information that we share on a social media Uh, site is being uh, analyzed in uh, using some server located in some uh, country miles away from where we are i think we are living in a world where whether we like it or not there are huge technological dependencies and there are huge policy implications on account of that now all of this translates to the larger theme of education because somewhere you know when we try to apply critical thinking we try to solve uh, for problems that we are confronted with uh, we try to do anything that a liberal education uh, should realistically promise you uh, with i think you know technology and its engagement with technology just becomes central uh, often to success in any of these attempts or efforts right. so take something like for instance critical thinking right and uh you know we we are going through a pandemic so i'm just going to uh, use an example from the pandemic a few days ago uh, i you know I, i saw someone tweeting out right that uh, uh, if you go to the state of kerala your likelihood of catching uh, the virus is very low on the weekends right i mean that's an interesting statement and the person has given some data to back it up right and uh, then i was i was really thinking yeah but if you are a critical thinker especially in a technology enabled world right you would question the data in the first place right is is the sample size you know really representative of what is happening on sundays in kerala right is the reason that the numbers are low in in kerala on sunday because there are less of people who are venturing out or because there is a triple lockdown over the weekends right so i think you know when when we talk about the data explosion and the data fight world i think it's also important to bring in a sense of humility to what uh, data can inform us about and what it cannot right and that's a that's a very important and interesting example of what technology can do and technology's limitation right you can use of course data artificial intelligence predictive tools and all of that to help you arrive at decisions i mean absolutely and it does bring about human efficiencies uh, certainly but there are realms of activity when where you have to be very careful when you bring about uh, data driven decision making and there are various limitations that data driven decision making intrinsically come with so uh, somewhere i think you know you you cannot be critical thinkers you cannot be problem solvers unless you are also aware of the limitations of the world that you are operating in and the limitations of the vocabulary of any discipline that uh, you are uh, you know, engaged with having said that again uh, the whole idea of the liberal education vision from the beginning at sai university and even the legal education vision was that there are two or three very specific ways in which technology changes these disciplines one of course is that the substantive vocabulary with which we are uh, grappling right be it data analytics or uh, be it you know understanding explainability the whole concept of explainability in algorithms and what that means for the world of law right how do you measure whether an algorithm is explainable or not right all these ideas really need a lot of disciplinary intervention like the the world of uh, you know law the world of uh, economics everything is is basically changing on account of the fact that technology is changing all across the second is how we end up working right as 
as groups as individuals that is really set to change or has already changed i would say significantly on account of technology right i mean many of you uh, over the course of the next uh, three years of your life will be working together as groups and i suspect that a lot of that work will be happening online i suspect that a lot of that work will be happening using spreadsheets using uh, google docs and all these various tools that we have right to collaborate better so uh, by the time you uh, you graduate somewhere uh, you should feel a sense of confidence in your ability to navigate the world of technology in a uh, successful manner especially in uh, professional settings the third is it all affects us as individuals right like the the very fact that many of us find it difficult to stay i find it difficult personally to stay off my phone for more than half an hour right it, it really changes human behavior and i think somewhere and some of you will pursue uh, research as a career right you may want to do doctoral programs you may want to uh, do market research and and for many of you who get into serious research the impact of technology on human behavior is going to be a massive area of thought leadership and thinking uh, you know in deep ways about what that means right so technology and behavior is a, is going to be a huge uh, set of uh, you know concerns and uh, going to drive a lot of thinking and finally the question of technology and inclusivity right is technology actually helping all of us the same way clearly not right like let's let's take something like uh, uh, the arogya setu app right that's the grand indian solution to vaccinate all of us i don't know how many of you have uh, got your vaccines but uh, for uh, people on uh, the older side of uh, life i mean we have all mostly got both doses and it has all been done through digital platforms and uh, this particularly this digital solution called arogya setu app right and then i was i was talking to uh, my maid uh, who works uh, for my parents in trivandrum and i was asking her you know have you got the vaccine she said how i don't know how to operate this platform i i don't even have a smartphone i have a feature phone right the product may be great but it's great for you it's not great for me right so and then of course you have to think about uh, governance mechanisms and solutions as to how to, how to make technology inclusive right if if of course we are moving more towards technology let's also be clear that it is a barrier as much as it's an enabler right so i think that's a fourth way in which we all have to think as citizens as individuals about what the impact of technology is in our life and all of this circle back to your education in data sciences computing and uh, liberal arts because somewhere you will never be able to design inclusive product design responsible algorithms and any of that unless you are able to think through these multiple dimensions of the technological disruption so people will tell you in the course of your career and uh, your time at siu and later too uh, that you know there is this great product there is this amazing app and uh, wonderful solution and it's it's great to use all of that it's important to know how to use it i mean because it does add to your workplace productivity and skills but it's also important to reflect at the same time as to how it really affects society what are its you know long term implications what are its short term ramifications and so on so coming to the world of law and then in many ways you know the the whole idea at at siu was that we we are not going to operate in in silos right we are going to build education models which respect the core discipline but take these insights from the world around us particularly the technological insight and then weave that into the curriculum so the the legal education at at siu uh, which i I'll, i'll speak a little more about and what we have done so far and uh, where we propose to go with all of this uh, was always meant to derive a lot of energy and sustenance from liberal arts and from data science and computing we unfortunately did not have that within the university last year when we launched the taksha fellowship but now i i i really hope to have joint lectures with some of you who are pursuing data sciences and and computing and, and those who are doing liberal arts are, again uh, you know, please you know join in these conversations and similarly the daksha fellows would benefit significantly from having your insights right a generation that is uh, one notch younger right and has very different views about technology very different relationship with with technology right so uh, i mean somewhere the whole idea was that we would really 
try to build these learning models that uh, uh, you know both, both contribute to and uh, uh, derive value from what the other discipline has to offer uh, and speaking specifically about legal education uh, there were three pillars around which uh, me and my team had really thought about legal education from the very beginning the the first you know grand theme was the technological theme right and uh, what that means i'll i'll come to uh, very shortly uh, but but to give you a quick answer i think data right and what is data doing to the world around us how are, how do we protect ourselves in a, in a world where uh, you know while while half jokingly uh, sort sort of pretty accurately people say mark zuckerberg probably knows more about you than your father right so in that world right like how are we going to really protect individual rights how are we going to uh, protect uh, you know our turf right as as human beings in the socio economic order that we are all going to kind of uh, enter uh, and and be a contributor to and a participant in uh, the second big you know pillar that we really kind of thought would be important uh, we want some time to is Uh, the whole idea of conflict in human relationships so i mean for for most of us conflict is this is this uh, kind of pejorative or negative word right where uh, oh you know people are are getting into a fight okay i'm going to take you to court right and that's where the lawyer comes in so by association the law is seen as a profession that really kicks in or finds its utility when human beings are fighting but the whole idea of conflict itself can be seen in very different ways right there is this whole school of thought around vantage point theory right and which says it is the vantage point from which each of us see things that result in conflict right it's it's not necessarily hatred it's not necessarily any negative emotion it's a by product of the fact that we all as human beings come with from a place of bounded rationality which i'm sure is a concept you're going to engage a lot uh, in your in your economics uh, courses and so on right so while of course we we bring in this uh, you know uh, while while we bring in this whole idea of uh, you know limitation right on um, can all of you hear me fine i i get uh, uh, nandini is it okay great so so while uh, you know uh, uh, we we all are confronting with these uh, challenges Uh, about you know uh, human conflict and there is an assumption that as as rational human beings you know we all uh, do what is best in our self interest and that can naturally translate to the better or betterment of society as a as a whole uh, somewhere you know behavioral economics has completely debunked that idea right that we we all come with uh, a sub, with a subject position and with a lot of uh, bounds and limitations on our rationality and these bound, these positions of bounded rationality and the vantage point limitations from which we look at the problem result in you know conflict so then how do you resolve that conflict better and can lawyers do better in resolving that conflict right? why do we have to constantly tell people look we'll help you take something to court can we help you in other ways right can we be that active participant in a discussion where you are uh, you know uh, uh, sitting across the table right uh, with with the person with whom you have a dispute and a lawyer can intervene and say look uh, let's let's try to look at what's your worst alternative what are what is your best alternative let's try and negotiate and the law comes in as this you know uh, sort of uh, abstract idea right which is lurking somewhere there and we know that look if if you do not resolve it then maybe you'll have to go to court and you may have to bring in all that legal ass and all that technical uh, you know stuff that we lawyers do statutes and regulations and this and that but let's not go to that point right let's try and resolve this dispute a little different so from this whole idea of looking at disputes from a more behavioral point of uh, from the perspective of the fact that as human beings we are all limited in what we can see and understand and there is there is some degree of respectful attitude to the other that comes in on account of the humility to accept that that point right uh, that we can then rethink the way 
we resolve disputes we don't have to necessarily go to court right and and of course there are huge economic efficiency gains too lawyers are expensive right the arbitrators are expensive I and mean, all of that right so we we need to have a different way to kind of try and resolve disputes without spending so much money spending so much effort and that's how the whole idea of a pillar on disputes resolution and alternate methods of dispute resolution came about in our thinking on legal education again hugely dependent on liberal arts and uh, uh, particularly uh, philosophy and uh, uh, behavioral economics to drive our thinking like for instance we have a course in the kshatriya fellowship on the human element in disputes which has very little to do with law and a lot to do with human behavior psychology uh, the vice chancellor's own cognitive neurosciences so there is there is so much that uh, we can actually take from these disciplines to completely reimagine disputes something as as basic as dispute something which is considered central to the legal discipline we can reimagine it and it we want to reimagine it. so that that was the second you know uh, big pillar the third was the regulatory state right i mean uh, so let me let me simplify this whole idea right i mean you have seen law movies and mostly in all your law movies you see uh, you know uh, the courts right that that's the imagination that that you have right but but you may also have seen uh, for instance very recently there was a, a very popular well rated tv show called scam 1992 did any of you watch that great okay so what was scam 1992 about rishita you had your thumbs up why don't you tell us what it was about hello sir hi good afternoon um actually i'm very much intrigued by the idea of investment and how the stock market works i see my father sitting every day from 9 to 3 in front oh. of the stock market so you and i was thinking of taking up some course and see how it works so i'm 1992 was relating to that only my mother doesn't like me getting into the share market so she was just stopping me rishita no you will not see that so i was getting a glimpse while they both were watching it on the television how right. i think it is about finding loopholes in the functioning of the share market uh, the legal things and then how do you make profit out of it if i'm not wrong absolutely right there was a very bright gujarati uh, businessman harshad mehta who basically realized that there are huge loopholes in the regulatory ecosystem there was no regulator they yeah, did not it have the securities and exchange yeah so the regulator we have that regulator thanks to mr mehta right if, if not for him we wouldn't have a regulator for the stock market but uh, this is one thing i don't like that it's not his fault like there are two schools one right. which hold him responsible that okay it was his wrong doing and the other say that it is the government's fault so i am from the second school that if there are loopholes and he made use of them for his profit what's wrong in that he didn't do anything illegal right it was all legal and the court couldn't prove anything it was like he just manipulated those loopholes i think jamshed we have our first laissez faire economist in our cohort <laughs> <laughs> that's great to hear i mean and i'm sure there are others here who feel very differently from you rishita on this right and and the uh, you know uh, and the perspective uh, of uh, okay i think there is some small adjustment i need to make here let me just uh, just jamshed sir what do you think is it right to make profit out of loopholes on the stock market in anything uh well i think i think uh, i'll leave the answer to professor padmanabha and i mean personally i i actually do trade stocks on my own i trade uh, uh options but you ha- but um and there's a question about whether it has value to the economy or not and probably not but it seems to me that uh, it's legal and i don't see anything wrong with finding loopholes as long as they're legal but i'll defer to uh, anand sir 
yeah no i i don't i don't want to get into the nitty gritties uh, yet about about the financial markets but that is a very good example i mean and for those of you who haven't watched it i, I think it's, it's a show worth seeing because it also gives you a lot of the geopolitics around uh, you know uh, india's liberalization right and what what really happened in the early 90s and uh, we are all at, at some level liberalization uh, children because it unlocked a lot of opportunities uh, you know and uh, at the same time it it has had its own challenges yes uh, i see the chancellor has his hand up anant uh, it's like this I, i would like to react to the question on financial markets yes sir i think in any liberal economy capital formation is a important part of any economy without capital formation there can be no industrial development without industrial development there can be no growth without growth there cannot be improvement in the quality of life of people so in order to have the capital formation capital markets are essential and the capital markets are essential for investors but investing for the long term improves the economy investing for short term purely becomes speculative and that is allowed because we have to have a market which is having both buyers and sellers without buyers and sellers there no market so then there are some buyers and sellers who are short term but they could be buyers and sellers who are doing for long term on the other opposite side of the same tra- transaction so one side of the transaction helps the economy other side of the transaction is speculative but even if it's speculative since they are creating a market for the transaction their buy or sell a transaction and there's a market and the board is legal and whatever is uh, legal transaction if they are doing and they are paying taxes on it it helps improve the economy ultimately even if it is a short term if it's greed if they are speculative they are helping to create a market and if they are making gains out of it they are paying taxes on that gains then it is in two ways is helping the economy both in capital formation and also in paying taxes so right sir as long as within the law i think it is in my opinion it is to be no problem with doing it absolutely sir and i think i think what really we saw with the harshad mehta uh, scandal is that the rules of the game had to be it was clear that there were no rules of the game right and that really is what that whole episode led to that some degree of uh, creating those rules and especially addressing the issue of information asymmetry between the regulator and uh, the markets right and and uh, i don't know how successful it has been uh, but but i do think that it's a lot better than what it was then or or even just think about the fact that when you go to a department store like maybe 5 years ago you would have plastics being used to give you your uh, you know whatever you're buying from the store right and today uh, either you have to pay a hefty amount like I mean, not a hefty amount but you know 10 rupees or 12 rupees and get a bag or you carry your own bag i mean these are all products of what we call the regulatory state right there is a thinking that uh, it's not enough to leave matters of law to parliamentarians and courts but you need regulators who can really kind of uh, uh, you know um, lay down the ground rules in different sectors different areas of human activity whether it's competition between conglomerates whether it's environmental safety or product safety more generally right electrical goods electronic goods all of that or it's financial markets right so in all these cases you need to bring about a, a sense of uh, leveling the playing field between market players uh, bringing about certain consumer protection standards so that consumers are safe right and uh, there is a fair degree of product safety and creating an architecture wherein uh, we can Uh, get uh, more agile rule making more expertise driven rule making i mean some of you after uh, the undergrad may decide that you want to uh, become bureaucrats and take the upsc exam right and you will then become a part of the regulatory machinery of the, of the some of you right so uh, so i think these are the three major pillars basically around which we felt you know the legal education model at sai university can derive a lot of energy from liberal arts and data sciences i mean coming to the regulatory state a lot of uh, work that happens around regulation uh, basically draws sustenance from the discipline of economics right 
So there is a lot of economic insight, uh, and when it comes to environment, you know, there's a lot of insight from uh, environmental sciences, right? And now with climate change, a lot of insight from uh, disciplines that look at climate change, study climate change uh, very seriously. So the the whole idea was that. when you look at legal education from these multiple perspectives right whether it's something as central to legal education as dispute resolution or something as novel as technology or something like the regulatory architecture which is all pervasive in our lives today though we don't talk as much about it as we should right in all these particular cases the world of law cannot operate just through a uh, bare engagement with the statutes and uh the regulations and so on it has to be integrated a lot better with disciplinary insights from uh, many of these disciplines that i i mentioned uh now the the technology part of it is something very close to my heart because i my my core areas of research are intellectual property rights and and technology law and policy so i'll i'll speak a little more to to that uh and and let's let's actually just again take some of the uh, very popular news items that that you know uh, we we see on a regular basis right pegasus anybody wants to uh, bring up pegasus and tell us what pegasus was all about i mean just all over the newspapers what is pegasus anyone i was ha ah, yes Okay, so yeah, yeah. you said spyware. Okay, great. What did the spyware do? Snoop around people. Sorry, Swam. Snoop around people, sir. Snoop, yeah, snoop into people and their lives, right? And uh, what made it controversial was the fact that allegedly this was being used by different state actors, right, to uh, understand what dissenters are talking about. So the whole question about uh, communications that are technically meant to be private but which can be intruded upon by the state right and uh, what are the safeguards against uh, unbridled state action in this in this regard right uh, so that that is just just one 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 news item that that i i wanted to bring up right another very very important episode was the whole uh, thing about shift in whatsapp privacy policy right and we we have seen a lot of debates around that should whatsapp share its data with facebook or not open question and i don't want to give you any answers but uh, yeah rushita you have your hand up so please i am from the school of thought where it is absolutely no no okay. who gives whatsapp the authority to share our data we are using their app they have no authority they have no right to share our data with their parent company so this is why you know i have many friends and family who quit whatsapp and they shifted to signal and then we had this uh, sandes the indian made uh, app so i am from the school of thought it's an absolutely no you, they shouldn't share our data Oh great! So you're not as lazy, fair as I thought you were. I, no, but see how your own position changes, right? Like when it comes to the stock markets, you are okay with you know private actors basically uh, profiting uh, because it's it's a private activity. But with WhatsApp, I mean, again, one way to look at it is it's a private relationship between you and the service provider, right? And you are availing the service. They're saying, look, if you want to avail the service, is what it is. Otherwise, you can. You don't use it, right? So, Anant, you might want to just say briefly what is laissez faire, right? Yeah, sure. No, the whole idea that uh, you know the state, the state has a very limited role in our lives, which is only to take care of law and order, right? And and human beings, so long as they are not inflicting harm on the other, the whole idea of Mill's harm principle, right? That. your freedom ends ends where my nose begins right so as long as you are not intruding on the uh, private space of an individual or the body of an individual the state has really no role to play in your life right and markets will essentially markets are the best mechanism rather uh, to take care of all commercial activities between human beings they can enter into contracts and if they you are not happy with the terms you are not going to get into the contract in the first place 
and and clearly uh, there is no society in the world i think today which believes in absolute laissez faire model right i mean every society will bring in some bit of checks and safeguards and so on in varied contexts and settings to ensure that uh, you don't leave everything to the choice of parties because choice is not a very easy uh, concept in the first place right that we uh, that the choices that you have may be very different from the choices that the employer has on the other side of the table right and so there is unequal bargaining uh, power often between individuals and and i think somewhere rishita that is what instinctively uh, is is rankling you right though maybe maybe not but i'm trying to uh, kind of understand your position right? the fact that you have this huge technology corporation right that is that's telling you something and you feel like i'm just an ordinary individual using it and uh, you know that that relationship doesn't seem all right and it's not a equal one so they shouldn't be allowed to do what they like my stand is just that uh, nobody should intrude on into my privacy like it's okay. my data mm-hmm. i should be deciding who gets to see it like though now they have made it really clear that your messages now they are marketing their agenda that we are not intruding into your data it is end to end encrypted whatsapp has no role so now they are making it clear which earlier it wasn't like they also mm-hmm. agree on this point that they are not going to see our data our messages they are going to uh, secure our privacy so that was just my point that they shouldn't get to see our data and when it was the harshad mehta case it is just like i am manipulating the loopholes for my benefit i am not doing anything illegal so till the time things are legal it's all fair and good <laughs> interesting yeah no i i think there is a lot of uh, literature now around this whole idea of what data means right is it just an economic commodity and this is some of the work that we do at the daksha philosophy some of the questions that we ask right is it an economic commodity which can be dealt with uh, between two individuals on a contractual basis or is it much more than an economic commodity is it is it like uh, bordering on what what you would call a human right right your right to privacy Uh, right and and is data that that vehicle by which privacy is enjoyed or forfeited and based on that maybe you know you need a very different regime to protect one's data and to tell others who hold that data what they can and cannot do with such data right so data protection is a big area where now there is a lot of thinking uh, at the law and policy level on how technology is uh, affecting our lives so that was another you know example and uh, and there are many many more right and uh, like every day when you when you look at the news uh, you see something or the other happening in the world of uh, technology just yesterday in fact reed hastings the founder of netflix uh, wasn't i mean i think he still is in delhi uh, maybe not but uh, he he had an audience with the minister of state for information technology right and uh, they were all talking about how netflix and the other over the top platforms need to be regulated should it be self regulation or should the state tell you what you should play or what not i mean we all have seen that certificate right when you watch a movie in the theaters i mean or even the television uh, uh, on cable television right that first certificate which is given by the censor board but really there is no censoring requirement for an amazon prime or a or a netflix except self censoring right i mean some self certification or censoring guidelines and now there is a lot of uh, push back from the state to say no that's not good enough because we would like a, a bigger say in what goes on and what individuals are watching right so these are all questions where technology uh, challenges law right essentially when when you have a cab aggregator service and you have motor vehicles law which has operated for the last 80 years in a certain manner with a certain licensing framework in mind and then you suddenly have these uh, ubers and uh, olas and so on and you can share a ride with somebody you have uh, you have this whole idea of an aggregator who's bringing together all these cab uh, drivers you don't need to take a license yourself the driver has to take the license and or the medallion as a college in new york right so i think i think basically what 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 all of this means is that 
new models new ways of bringing about efficiency which are powered by technology compel us to think about the world differently and compel us to think about laws and regulations and policies very different so one kind of framing that i often use is uh, using four c's right the the first c is content plus data of course so all these questions around netflix and what they can uh, play and how they should be regulated or questions around what's happened its privacy policy and what they can do with your data and they cannot do those fall within the bucket of content right and uh, you know there are many many such complicated questions on what what is the responsibility of a youtube to take down a video when there is uh, somebody else's copyrighted work you know put up there or there is you know uh, some other problem with the video right there is some gambling advertisement up there and the law says you cannot advertise you know casinos you cannot advertise alcohol right so you have to take down that ad but what is youtube's responsibility and those are very complicated questions but the idea is that all of these in my uh, view falls within what you what i call the content bucket then there is the whole thinking around carriage right uh, mr ramani is actually the best person to talk about carriage being a telecom Uh, entrepreneur for many years i mean the whole idea that all this data doesn't come for free right it and it doesn't come without a lot of things happening the technical back end which we don't see right we 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 may see the telecom tower but we don't really see you know everything else that goes behind you know uh, the scenes to ensure that you are able to take a call or you are able to uh, send that video file to your friend right so Uh, basically that whole you know uh, technological infrastructure back end comes within what i call the uh, you know carriage layer and that's getting more complicated as we speak today we have devices that can talk to each other right what you call internet of things right i mean yeah, you you have sensors you know all around and these sensors can pick data from different points and relay it back to a server or for instance my pet peeve the drone industry right how drones work a lot of indian drone industry is not about drone manufacturing because china has always been a market leader there but it's about using all that data that you gather from drones and servicing that data right analyzing that data like suppose you are a construction company or uh, you know and and you want to uh, measure whether you are flouting the building norms right is it taller than what you are supposed to build is each floor taller than what it what it supposed to be all of that is so easy it instead of sending a person up there and measuring it send a drone and you can really capture all that data satellite imagery rescue right vaccine delivery we are seeing a lot of drone deployment to deliver uh, vaccines right in inaccessible parts of the world so i mean all of these are basically technologies that are able to talk to i mean or physical hardware that is able to talk to each other right Uh, using some uh, you know radio waves basically and there is spectrum allocation that goes into that so there there is a lot that lawyers uh, have to do in that world which is the uh, carriage layer the third is you know the whole issue of competition right you have all these behemoths you have the amazons you have the googles is there room to build another search engine right if all the data is is really with uh, google is there room to build another e-commerce you know player if if amazon is so dominant it knows everything about your buying uh, preferences right and uh, it knows everything about what the local vendor is pricing at right so all that information is basically with the e-commerce entity right so then the question arises is there going to be enough competition uh, such that as consumers we can all get better products we can get a wider range of uh, you know digital uh, services so competition becomes an important uh, you know aspect of thinking about law and uh, technology and finally above all of this the fourth c the most important c the constitution right what does the constitution say about all of this the constitution is a technology as agnostic document right it, it does not say look when there is social media this is the extent of free speech that you have it doesn't say when there is a you know an over the top platform this is the extent of privacy that you have it says you have the right to privacy it says you have the right to free speech the right to equality it does not say you know when a bank 
bank official decides your loan application this is the equality that you have and when an algorithm decides whether you are entitled to a loan or not this is the equality that the right to equality that you enjoy no it says this is your right to equality in whichever setting it is a huge area of headache for judges for law, for lawmakers for everybody how do you adapt this document and it is a it is a bigger source of headache the older the constitution is if i if i ask an american lawyer or a judge uh, he or she is going to say oh what a nightmare right you have this whole idea of believing in the original ideas of the of the constitution and adapting it to a completely different world like can the police you know send a drone to uh, conduct surveillance activities right or follow a criminal or put a sensor is that evidence admissible it is there are a host of questions there which is great right so that makes uh, law and the constitution so fascinating i mean all these rights that we assume we have uh, are put under strain when you speak about these rights and the way you enjoy them in a technological setting right it it becomes far more challenging uh, for 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 lawyers to grapple with these with these questions so these are some of the ways in which technology is really challenging law right and challenging uh, policy now how do you kind of address these things right i mean of course there are challenges but who who is best placed let me reframe that question who is best placed to address these challenges i think someone with a firm grounding in liberal arts data sciences is best placed to address these challenges i have been working in this field for the last uh, 10 years or so right and uh, i mean i had you know a lot of differing uh, perspectives towards this one as a practitioner then as a as a hardcore researcher and academic then in a think tank and now as an education administrator and an educator right and in all these different through all these different hats i i wear the, there is one thing that i always wish and still wish that somebody taught me data science somebody taught me uh, you know computational sciences because the fuel for all of this is basically data science what are what are those guys doing there in the back end like what are they doing with your data right and and i mean unless you really know that discipline or have some working knowledge right? and similarly at, at any given point I, i i have when i grapple with these questions wish somebody taught me cognitive neuroscience and psychology how i could understand technology and behave right because i mean i i had a very conventional education i went to i mean i went by the rankings maybe i was an engineer for a year i mean engineering student for a year and then decided no it's not working out because i can't uh, i and i wish that engineering was different back then right i mean we had to do that smithy and foundry and all of that and I, i was a very weak kid and i couldn't really move any of those things and i decided oh god this is not for me and at the same time i was very interested in all these issues happening around around me and the only place that seemed to fit the bill for me was national law school so i i decided to become a lawyer because that was the only university in the country at that point where these debates were happening in a really vibrant way at an undergrad level so i had to become a lawyer i guess right so i ended up doing law and yes of course the education was it was good we had some uh, polar exposure to political science economics sociology and all of that uh, but but i i feel that it was all taught in a very conventional way and and had i mean i i now feel that this is a great time in education right there are educators who can train you better and there are students who are willing like all of you here right to push yourself stretch yourself and say look i don't want to be in the comfort zone of this disciplinary you know thing right oh you know after five years i go and roll at the bar and i'm happy to do a three year law program after three years of liberal arts education right and i think this is really the best track and and really the the best set of educators that uh, you know you could you could get to train you in this in this journey uh, so welcome on board really happy to uh, have you all here and i hope to see you all on campus you know as we resume on campus operations sooner than later uh, time for questions thoughts the floor is all yours and that maybe you could pose a provocative question about that relates to their everyday use of uh, 
of uh, digital everyday use of data, see what they say. Sure, sure. Okay, so let's let's say that you guys have any of you you have shot a video, right? I mean, and I mean it's it's one of you. Let's say who's a who's a good singer in this cohort. I've I've heard that all of you are multi talented. So okay, nobody wants to self select as a singer. I know, I know that pain. Veda is a great singer. Ah, uh, who Veda? Veda is Veda. Uh, <laughs> Trying hard, but you can use me as an example. Okay, Veda. Let's let's say that you you cut a song, right? And and while you compose your, I mean, you you want to create your own music, of course. But we all at the times tend to be inspired by something that we hear. Right? So you use a small a digital sample, right, of something that uh, you you heard somewhere, something very uh, mellifluous or something maybe even jarring because you want to contrast your song with with the jarring effect right and you use that and and uh, you post it on youtube uh the 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 owner of the copyright the owner of that jarring you know piece of work basically writes to youtube right saying veda song copies mine right and and i should uh, and you should i mean youtube has to take it down uh, how would you respond to that do you think it's fair firstly I do. Um, oh, you think it's fair? Okay. I will tell you. Uh, so, uh, I, I I won't say I'm a singer, but I am a musician. I play the guitar. I uh, haven't made any piece of music on my own, but I do think that if you make music on your own, and e even if you are taking inspiration from another piece, I would uh, if you're using the exact same piece of music, I would say it is a uh, like. A way of copying, and uh, maybe if you give credit to them or something, or with permission, sometimes uh, they do. But I don't think you should use uh, a piece of music of someone else or something like that in your music and take credit for it. I'm not sure exactly how to explain it, but uh, no, no, I get your point. Yeah, I mean, that is somebody's property, right? Essentially, yes, and you don't right. want to kind of free ride. On someone's property. Any differing thoughts on this, or anybody who agrees with the same? Either way, you agree, Rishita. Property. Okay. Anyone who feels that to have more creativity in society, it's fine once in a while if somebody uses a little bit of someone else's music, but essentially creates something that's dominantly her own. So, and I feel if you're taking permission, that works. And if you're giving due credits, it mm -hmm. works. Obviously, mm -hmm. if something is mine and somebody else uses it without my permission, I'm going to sue that person okay. to the core. <laughs> Because <laughs> this is that is mine. How can you use it? That was my creativity, and how can you earn on my thing? So, okay. and even law holds it, right? We have those copyright sections yeah, and yeah, all, yeah. where yeah. it is mandatory. To either mention that this has been copied, or you have to take permissions, prior permissions, right? So, okay. So now let me vary this question a little bit. Okay, Jugal, you have your hand up. Let Let me hear you. Um, I wouldn't mind if someone uses my um my music because personally, um, I've just created it, and you can obviously use it. Um, nothing wrong in that. Uh, in fact, I'll be honored because you're using my music. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay, great. So now let me vary this up a little bit, right? Uh, many of you here have Android phones, I guess, right? Yes, sir. Great. So, do you know that the whole code of the Android phone was basically built on something which, I mean, the the APIs or the what you call the processing, I mean, application processing interface, right? Which is what coders used to refer back. And like refer to a line of code, which makes coding a lot easier. I mean, I'm not a coder, but this is the the whole idea that you know you can refer to these lines of codes, headers, footers, all of that, and then you know that entire architecture was basically copied. So will you stop using your Android phone? Who was it copied from? So this was a huge copyright dispute, Jamshed, between Google and um, uh, Google was Oracle. 
because oracle acquired the the lines of code and and google of course uh, used it and, and i mean and google said look we can independently develop it it's not that we don't have the expertise there's a particular reason they didn't which is that a, a whole generation of coders were trained in the headers and footers and the language and therefore it's not about developing things independently it's about having the technical support right and you would lose out on the technical support if you couldn't independently i mean you couldn't uh, uh, depend on the lines i mean the apis that were already owned by oracle so to say the java lines of code basically the java programming uh, language right so the matter went up to the us supreme court and i mean i'll come to what the outcome is but what are your thoughts before outcomes what the supreme court said and all of that how many of you think that oh. google is fine and how many of you think that you know oracle has a strong point there so jugal here uh, i think google's all right because uh, mm -hmm. uh, you're basically sharing resources in order to um, develop um, in the industry like uh, you you're going for technical developments and that's always a good sign so there is a larger social context which then your basic answer is there's a larger social context which then makes it all right to take somebody's property yes in the long term in the long term okay right anybody rishita I, yeah i differ on this okay google was not any it had no social intention the only hmm. intention was to make money let's be straight with that you copy okay. someone else's okay. product so that okay. you know, i said technological developments i didn't say anything about social development i said technical she is kind of interpreting it as finally somebody wants to make money dakshaja that's a new voice can we hear you on this um i agree with rishita so because okay. as long as um whether it's any service or any platform any product if somebody is copying your ideas or using the same uh, same uh, product or service uh, to gain you know financially and to make profits off of it then i think that will be a larger issue either they need to um, come to a settlement and pay some loyalties or something of that sort or uh, the opposition like the person who have they've stolen from can obviously sue them so yeah i think that it's it's just not fair so okay. and the so, the social aspect you know it 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 doesn't seem very huge when the uh, when the uh, topic of money and finance comes into play so when you're making profit i don't think social services you know i don't think it's much important more important than this okay okay so you you basically think that yeah this is a huge corporation and of course google was not the google that we know today when android was being developed right so do keep that in mind <laughs> i mean at some level oracle oracle was a much bigger corporation then right and and the whole argument was we are the new guys and we are the disruptors right and the disruptor needs tools to disrupt with and these tools exist and we don't have the time to wait for coders to learn our own language we'd rather use language which everybody is familiar with and language is language right i mean so well so so uh, any other thoughts uh, I, i i i would like to hear more thoughts about about all of this yeah rashita back to you also one more thing sir we have this uh, thing called non disclosure agreements like if i mm -hmm. go on uh, and become a developer in some company so they make me sign that non disclosure agreement so that i am not discussing their ideas with somebody else mm -hmm. so if this is how if they make their employees sign this because you know emplo employee no, this was entirely a, reverse engineered there was no employee violating any nda they just reverse engineered it they're smart exactly guys. if employee is doing this so the companies use the employee using right. that whole thing but hmm. now because some another organization is doing it now it becomes an issue whether it is right or wrong but if hmm. it would have been some normal employee like me they would have hmm. sued me that okay you had signed yeah, this non disclosure agreement okay But, but now because uh, huh. sorry please go on. but now because it's a big organization mm. and maybe they must they might be having some political support or i don't know the result which you will be telling us soon but because now it's between two rival parties so now it has become a question of right or wrong 
yeah okay so i mean okay if there are no other thoughts i can tell you sir uh, oh, yeah, Eric, Eric. Eric. yeah sorry Eric, sir uh, uh, like uh, is how, how did the google get the set of code from oracle is it like is they did they reverse engineer from the software level or uh, did they steal it uh, can no, you no there's no the stealing code? they reverse engineered it. they they basically reverse engineered it uh, by by looking at the functionality and going peeling layer after layer going back to the code and was it open source or no right no, uh, it was oracle not. code no it was uh, copyrighted I owned by oracle uh, I mean, if i think uh, google is on the right side because uh, if uh, google stole the code from scratch like exact lines then it makes sense to oracle to copyright i mean uh, uh, you know say like make allegations and stuff but google you know uh, took the software from the overall product and you know break, broke it down to scratch so i don't think uh, yeah, they put in the effort and i don't think they are, uh, they literally stole the product so uh, i think google is on the right side okay okay any other thoughts uh maybe not th- uh, maybe I any mean, not exactly but uh i feel uh like in this case the supreme court might have uh, judged in google's favor okay i'm coming to the outcome yeah. so this is actually one of the most complicated uh, you know recent cases on law and technology right and uh, and and, and uh, ironically there were there were two courts that agreed with rishita and dakshaja there was only one court that agreed with jugal and kaushik but that one court was the us supreme court and the other two were lower scaring. courts yeah so two courts two lower courts agreed with both of you so in terms of numbers many more judges agreed with you but in terms of impact well i'm sorry but the us supreme court said it doesn't matter we don't think uh you know uh, google is in the wrong in fact they said this is fair use and so there's a whole principle of fair use in copyright law now coming back to the question i had posed to veda right about the song so one way to look at it is yes you are taking somebody else's property another way to look at it is you are taking it to create something which is what us courts have t- traditionally called transformative use right like you see dub smash right people do all this funny stuff and you know you take some uh, politician speech and i mean technically well i mean it's it's his speech right you're violating his copyright but if you're using it for some mean is it a violation no it's a parody it's transformative right so the law gives you that kind of elbow room and why is this all important in the technology context it's important because technology is a huge enabler for all of this stuff right in a non tech setting there were far less avenues for us to do all this technology has made us all prosumers right we are not pro- just pro- there is no binary of a producer and a consumer we are all producers and consumers at the same time we are prosumers so we all add our own imprint of creativity to a lot of things that we do so therefore it challenges these ideas about property right the way the same way you know technology challenges our ideas around human rights and free speech and you know, all of that yes veda Uh, so you talk about dub smash but uh, dub smash uh, isn't really taking credit for somebody else's um, property right like so music if i've made a piece of music and i've got gotten legally copyright and patent right then that makes it legally mine right but uh, a speech or a, a music that you're not taking credit for like um, what tiktok or dub smash does is uh, you're just using their music but you're not using the music to make a uh, new music uh, new music that is that you get credited for right so what what's the difference or i i get i get what the yeah. i i can really see somebody being very uh, feeling that sense of internal torture right there is property there is something called property but there's also something called crediting people right and and these are to the lawyer these are very different things that's the that's the very simple answer of course it's it's a lot more complicated because there are things called moral rights within copyright and so on but but to the lawyer i mean the broad answer to all of this is there is the the property right is independent of whether somebody crediting another or not 
i can credit someone for uh, i mean i can credit uh, let's say uh, you know a, gra- a great uh, you know music composer right and and say that to have credited but well you have violated the property right despite the crediting right even if you are not claiming it to be your own work the the replication of that work without authorization is how what the law defines as a wrong i mean so how we look at rights and wrongs and uh, where property is important where morality is important because crediting is really about a, a sense of morality right that's why you call it moral rights in the first place right and so th- these are the big tensions in in the law right we we don't have clear answers we don't have straightforward answers to anything when it comes to law and in that sense it is it is a it is a very fascinating discipline right because it's about how i mean how the google lawyer and how the oracle lawyer present two very different versions of legal reality to the judge and how the judge then you know kind of processes all of this and arrives at a conclusion so there is a lot of storytelling but it is what i call specialized storytelling because you can't just you know say something that you like you have to ground it in 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 the rules and in the regulations and so on but once you know those basics it's really very innovative right how you kind of create an argument you know in an interesting way so i'm i'm sure that you know a lot of things that you learn in your in the ne- the journey for the next 3 years of your life is really going to give you those tool kits right the rest the rest of it is actually not difficult if you know to read information process it ask the right questions do what is called active reading right and processing of information law is not difficult to pick up i mean i've seen uh, you know that uh, in fact some of the most successful lawyers in the country are from very di- had made their marks in very different disciplines i mean hari salve was a well, well rep- a very reputed chartered accountant uh, who had engaged with regulations and stuff and then i think he went to evening college or something and got a law degree but really was never you know trained in the way that many many of us were trained in in law but i mean well you you have a uh, you have these tool kits at your at your disposal right so that's what a liberal education that's also something that a liberal education can do right among many other things of course but also to kind of help you sort of think Uh, and engage with information in in very nuanced ways and and build a certain attention to detail right and which is basically what law is uh, making use of uh, finally right so i think i have overshot my time a little bit but i'm happy to, i'm happy to stay uh, uh, you know you guys have a long had have 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 already had a uh, bunch of you know conversations and uh, you have some more coming your way today tomorrow day after uh, but any any other thoughts questions happy to yeah rishita please um so you are from the law background it's uh, i know i don't know whether i should ask this or not but still you feel law is biased which profession is not biased is engineering not biased <laughs> i mean now we are talking about algorithms and algorithmic bias and i don't want to get into all the technicality of it i am not the best person maybe even to do that but uh, every every profession will have its own set of biases that come with what that discipline believes in or uh, debunks as right and wrong right so yes law may be have may have many more of that because it's it's probably a very human discipline right i mean there is just so much of that whole tension between human beings right and uh, there are there are a lot of emotions at play i right? think so perhaps this anand i know we're running late but um i can't resist <laughs> yeah. asking this question many of our students in this batch uh have expressed an interest someday in being entrepreneurs and starting companies and of course our founder was a software entrepreneur but i mean if a student or after they graduate they want to to uh start up a company that uh, involves software or technology uh what would you advise them in terms of you know as a startup with just a few 
people and very little money, what would be their obligation in terms of getting proper legal advice on on uh, before they uh, try to market their product? Right. You know that I think that's a very very important aspect of any any startup that you do right i mean so I, I would i would say that it it a lot depends on the 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 product that you develop right if it's consumer facing to me patenting is pretty useless in the world that we live in right i mean there will be somebody who uh, looks at your solution especially if it's software solutions and will figure out a way to uh, you know reverse engineer and write code which is which is outside the very narrow limits of patent patent protection that you can get for software and uh, uh, so essentially if it's consumer facing my advice would really be focus on the brand protect your brand protect that brand come what may right it has to be trademarked and it's not at all expensive it's not even complicated today there are a lot of legal tech startup right, including my uh, one that i know from nls uh, called vakil search i mean nls uh, guy who started this product called vakil search they i mean so you can easily register your company you can uh, register your brand using products like vakil search legal tech solutions like like vakil search right so it it doesn't even cost you much because yes that's one big concern right our lawyers going to cost a lot i mean i am a small you know bootstrap maybe even bootstrap right so now if you are if you are into high tech right if you are looking at either b2b solutions or you are doing something like quantum computing or any other kind of uh, you know uh, what what you could call moonshot kind of solutions i think that's where patents and uh, patents in particular become very important because your investor would like the comfort of a patent right when you are going for your seed funding or the next series a and so on the, having that portfolio of patents would would make a make a big difference right so for consumer tech i don't really see that as the big driving force because the big driving force often is do you have a well protected brand and do you have huge network effects that can come about as on account of your business by network effects what i mean is basically a lot of dependency on your product right like today yes somebody mentioned signal and whatsapp right but how many of you have completely deactivated whatsapp and moved to signal i don't think anybody here we all keep that whatsapp app right even if you are not happy with what they have done because there's huge dependency on that not only from your end you have all your networks and contacts there i mean a big part of your your community so to say is is basically there like or swiggy right i mean you tomorrow there could be another food uh, you know delivery aggregator but the fact that all these uh, you know restaurants are there and now swiggy has its own cloud kitchens there right they are able to give you better discounts and better variety and all of that so even if somebody has a better technology better patented product so to say the standards for a consumer facing solution are always i think set on account of network effects and what you call switching costs so to give you a very good example your keyboard right the qwerty keyboard that you use there was always a better keyboard out there called dorak right and sometimes when you now download these mobile keyboard applications right they give you dorak you can ask for a dorak uh, you know application but the world does not use dorak largely right we all largely use qwerty because you know that's just how devices have been built and we are so used to all these devices being built using qwerty right so there can sometimes be better tech- technical solutions and you could have better legal protection for those solutions but it may not be very useful in the market so i think finally it all comes back to uh, you know the kind of business that you are doing because even within technology there are so many different uh, kinds of solutions out there the second thing of course is there is a lot of help available it is and that way i think things have really changed even at the government level there is a lot of help like for instance there is this uh, uh, very useful uh, body called invest india which sort of helps you with single window uh, clearances and with navigating the whole regulatory ecosystem now now not all of us are going to be as lucky as uh, uh, the the inventors of the uh, wild west days of the internet right uh, who could sit in a garage and design and there was nothing to worry about we are not in that world anymore right whether you are designing an over the top content platform or a social media platform the regulator is now caught on to you 
right? They all have a position of view on what you should be doing and what you cannot do. So how do you navigate that? Right? Increasingly, technology is getting more and more within the regulatory ambit. Uh, so there is a lot of information available out there and government too gets it. The government of India particularly gets it that you know there are many young startup entrepreneurs who can't afford to pay the hefty you know, legal bills that a Facebook or a Google can afford, right? So what we do for them is we create machinery within the government uh, with, with a strong digital interface and so on with the state actors and bodies like Invest India, which help you navigate that regulatory ecosystem. Uh, Tamil Nadu, for instance, has something called Guidance Tamil Nadu, which again tries to help you as an investor navigate the ecosystem right so there are as we speak the world is getting better like a society like india which earlier looked looked down on entrepreneurship i would say right is now finally kind of saying look we would like more of our next uh, generation uh, to become entrepreneurs to become job creators rather than job seekers right and and as we move into that uh, world there are, there are going to be many more solutions and many more crowdfunded solutions as well, right? A lot of platforms like Reddit itself helps a lot of blockchain entrepreneurs navigate the whole you know, legal uh, issues around it. I've seen so many fascinating conversations, Reddit threads, which really give you the full picture of what you can and cannot do, right? And, and what the regulatory architecture is. So you don't need to consult the law. You just need to know how to use Reddit, right? And be part of these communities. So I, I personally feel that in the world that we, we are in today, community is everything. Right? Whether it's finding a job, I mean, earlier, you know, the whole idea of finding a job is, oh, there is a recruitment cell and they're going to help. No, that world is, to me, that world is over. Right? The recruitment cell will help you present yourself, present the best version of yourself. But finally, you have to be strongly, actively involved in community. And, and while, I mean, giving a very broad answer to... Uh, point that Jamshed had raised, I think your ability, whether to start up, whether to get legal help, whether to find a new job, everything in the world that we are in today and going to get more and more into this is about how well entrenched you are in the communities and networks around you. Right? And build that presence and start you know, engaging more and more. And that will help you find solutions at, at, at affordable rates and at scale for many things that you want to put out there. Yeah, please go ahead. So one last question, um, like Jamshed sir asked that entrepreneurs, once we are, we have decided on like, like, for example, I'll just relate it to my, uh, with me. Like right now I have a business plan, an idea, and I'm very keen on doing it in the coming months. Like. Okay. It's there in my head that I have to do this. It's a, hmm. it's, it's an entrepreneurship idea. So now it's, it's obviously it will start on a very small scale. So should I be seeking legal help right now, or I should just let things flow? Like, because it, it's just cocooning out. So according to me, you bring in lawyers or you start taking legal help only at a point where you are really ready to face the world with your product right and it's when you when you face the world with, the, with your product that there is somebody else interested in copying it at, if at all uh, the second thing is that copying is rife in the world it's it's rife there is no there is no business idea uh, at least in the indian digital economy where i have seen uh, gone that has gone uh, not like that has not been copied, right? And, and yeah, some of them have ended in court, but most of them have not because the entrepreneur would rather just focus uh, her energies entirely on growing the business and surpassing the comp the the competition, right? And uh, raising more money, right? And having much more to spend on marketing and promotions rather than take the legal battle, right? Uh, the legal battle often comes in when you're going for your IPOs. I mean, that's what I've seen with some of the bigger Indian startups, right? Like around the time you, and by then you're not a startup, right? If you're, if you're going for an IPO, I mean, a public offering, it, it is pretty clear that you've become so big that, you know, the public trusts you to buy stock in your 
organization right so so i think you know the the immediate answer is to work on the product right and work on the customer interaction right and and really getting that part right and uh, if at all there there is fear of any kind of copying to protect the brand so nobody can pass off as your brand if they are passing i mean if they are giving an equal solution i think the answer is not to go legal the answer is to beat them at the marketing game beat them at the customer acquisition so it's not basically a product it's mm-hmm. a consultancy service okay. which i am thinking and there's no issue for copying like okay uh, i have no uh, as such issues that someone would copy me what i meant by legal help was like when the transactions and all are happening mm. so you know there this comes into play this tax giving and all i, I don't know the legal terminology no, I but get you. Ah, yeah, yeah. should i be uh, concerned with that or should i just start like whatever i've thought and i should just put that on to feel yes. I, i would suggest this is wonderful um uh, and and i'm so grateful that professor padmanabhan has engaged with us i would suggest if you you can follow this up directly with the uh, anand sir if that's okay with you yeah absolutely and um cuz cuz uh, this is exactly what we want to come out of these things thanks thank you thank you sir Yeah. So I already have all the things put up on paper, and I'm just waiting to launch it. Great. I'm happy to take a look. Bad idea or good idea? I don't know, but I'm very keen on launching it. Mm. Well, Anand, I, I think it's it's after probably we've been having different sessions with the students, and you may may not know this, but it's been. nearly a month where we've engaged with the students it's called the cohort connect series where we've got different speakers but i must say that that i think this is the most chatty they've been and it oh, is it okay yes and and uh, you know i've been a witness to most of them and i can say that and it clearly commends the need of interdisciplinarity which you even exhibited that how legal fields now draw from uh, you know interdisciplinary fields whether it is environment or whether it's technology and you know how you explained it to them about you know uh, what is the role of uh, intermediaries like facebook whose content is it or who's to be blamed or whether you spoke to them about a simple example of using of plastic you know throwing in the whole regulatory framework and how it is evolving or even the 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 dispute resolution bit that you touched upon i think it's triggered a lot of thoughts and i'm sure they must be really confused at this point of time as to um, whether they've made a mistake by not taking law at this level or whether should they look at um, legal fields in the future or whether should they just uh, request uh, professor barucha to get uh, dr anand padmanabhan to do at least one or two lectures every week so it could be a mix of <laughs> any all everything so the students are exhilarated and thank you for bringing them so alive and so vibrant and especially after a lunch and and the first day of such a heavy session so thank you so much it was very insightful and i'm sure the faculty um, which includes you as well will design enough ways to communicate with these students off and on and there'll be enough opportunities for everyone and for people like rashita jugal who believe some believe in the open source some don't believe in that to come together and create something wonderful so thank you so much thank you really uh, for taking the time and talking to our students thanks neha and thanks everybody for your patience and wish you all the very best and sure i'm always around so you know uh, there's no formalities you can just reach out to me anytime and i look forward to more such sessions with each of you 